Hi, Jorge. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. It's a cold day here in the Bay Area. In in San, in San Francisco itself, or or right. I'm right now in Emeryville. Uh, Emeryville is uh, the other side of the Bay Bridge, close to Berkeley and Oakland. Okay. Uh, well, let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. Uh, this is the Wright Show um, on Meaning of Life TV. You are Jorge Ferrer. You are a professor of East West Psychology at the California Institute, Institute of Integral Studies. I think is that right? That's correct. Uh, I'm also going to be teaching in a new online program. It's called Integral and Transpersonal Psychologies at CIS. But East West Psychology is where, where I'm teaching right now. Okay. And transpersonal psychology is something that we are going to be discussing along with something apparently related called participatory spirituality, of which you are an advocate. And I gather all of this is related to a book you wrote called Revisioning Transpersonal Theory, A Participatory Vision of Human Spirituality. Mm -hmm. Now, before we explain what transpersonal psychology and participatory spirituality are, which we will get around to, I gather you see participatory spirituality as addressing a problem in the world, which is that there are all these people with different religious beliefs that may seem incompatible. Sometimes the people are dogmatic about them. Sometimes they are aggressively dogmatic about them. Yes. It might be better if they weren't. Um, and... Uh, Various solutions, I guess, have been proposed to this problem. There, there's one that I want to talk about that uh, you don't think is the best solution, and you see participatory spirituality as an alternative to, and that is what's called perennialism, the so-called perennial philosophy. Do you want to tell us what the perennial philosophy is, first of all, and then we'll talk about why you see it as having shortcomings? Yes. Well, there are many different forms of perennial philosophy, but basically it affirms like a unity and a kind of a underlying unity uh, in all religious traditions. And this unity can be defended, for example, uh, as an esoteric core, something that if you go beyond dogmas, beyond doctrines, you know, you find like kind of an experiential core, like for example, an underlying unique mystical experience that is common across traditions. Okay. And I think that's problematic. So there's two, there's two claims here in a way. I mean, one is that this experience that is said to be common to different religious traditions, if, if, if kind of obscure, I mean, if not necessarily evident superficially in the religious traditions, it is said to lie in their ancient roots or somewhere. Anyway, it is said to be common to them. And, 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 and there's first the claim that it is, in fact, common to them. And if you dig hard enough, you will find this uh, tradition in these different uh, religions. And then secondly, there's the claim that this is valid, that this experience we're talking about is a valid form of insight, that it aligns you with the truth or gives you insight into the truth. Now, do you, which of those, or, or is it both, that you take issue with? I think I take issue with both, uh, in the sense that I don't think there is like a common mystical experience across traditions. Mm -hmm. I think different traditions are kind of like uh, co-creating and acting and bringing forward different spiritual uh, experiences, events, and also uh, perhaps even a spiritual worlds and ultimates, you know. So in that way, I disagree with that kind of commonality about one mystical experience across traditions. And I also, I don't think that it's just one one experience that is going to reveal kind of uh, the ultimate nature of reality. Uh, I think there are many different kind of like uh, kind of unfoldings of reality and the different traditions like uh, kind of like co-create different unfoldings of reality and uh, they call it different spiritual ultimates, right? Mm -hmm. For example, the Christians call it a personal God or uh, Satyananda and the Hindus, the Buddhists call it Sunyata. I don't think they refrain to the same thing, and this is one of the issues I have with perennialist thinking. Whereas the perennialist claim would be that, whether they call it God or Sunyata or whatever, they're talking about ultimate reality, contact with ultimate reality, and it's the same ultimate reality they're all having contact with if it's expressed in so much different ways. And this gets back, uh, I guess, partly to Aldous Huxley's book, uh, The Perennial it's Philosophy. That's, I guess, where the term uh, comes from. And the perennial philosophy is kind of Eastern in flavor, right? I mean, there, there is, of course, a Christian mystical tradition. There is Jewish mysticism. There is Islamic mysticism. But, but I, I gather that the, 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 I haven't read Huxley's book, but I gather that the, the experiences described will probably be more commonly, more obviously found, let's say, 
in, 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 in Buddhism or in, in Vedanta Hinduism or something like that, right? That's exactly right, Bob. Uh, you know, like uh, in many ways, like uh, even though the claim is that all traditions agree about that kind of ultimate truth, uh, whenever the main proponents of the perennial philosophy in contemporary times, you know, have been kind of sympathizers with kind of uh, Eastern traditions or Middle Eastern traditions. So like uh, Houston Smith, you know, Nasser, um, Shuon, you know, many of them would say that even though they claim uh, all traditions would agree about that kind of ultimate reality, like, for example, they would say Advaita Vedanta has the best or most accurate articulation, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Nasser is a Sufi, uh, Shuon and uh, Houston Smith favor like this kind of a new Advaita version of perennial philosophy. Which, and of which course, is a, uh, which, which is yes. a non-dual uh, the, the idea, that, that would be the experience of the self kind of merging with the rest of reality and seeing no distinction between the two. Exactly, a non-dual monistic metaphysics, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and, that's, I, and that's Houston Smith you're talking about, very famous kind of scholar of religions, wrote a famous book on the world yes, of religions. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And of course, within the field of transpersonal psychology, uh, Ken Wilber, who, no, who he doesn't longer identify himself with the field, but he was like the main proponent of this of this doctrine, also Stanislav Grof also would fall into this category, but uh, Ken Wilber also kind of, you know, he describes okay. this kind of like ultimate experience in a very zen, advaiting way, you know, it's like this kind of like one taste, this kind of uh, Atman Brahman, non-duality, and so forth, although he has his own version of non-duality, that in a way is different than the traditional ones, but that's a different that's, story. That, that's interesting, because Ken Wilber is somebody that people keep telling me I should read, but every time I look at one of his books, it seems like I would have to take a whole course in Ken Wilber's system before I could even understand one of his books, right? And life is short. But that's, 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 that's the drill. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, uh, but it's interesting. So you say he was at once identified with um, <clears throat> transpersonal psychology. As you mm -hmm. are, so why don't you maybe now tell us, before we get more into participatory spirituality, what is transpersonal psychology? Well, many people will have different stories and definitions of the field, but I would say that, uh, you know, looking at the origins help us to, to really understand what it is, you know, and it was originated out of the confluence of different uh, schools of thought, you know, one was like uh, humanistic psychology mm -hmm. and the work of Rahan Maslow's, you know, understanding of uh, self-actualization and emphasis on big experiences, you know. Maslow was saying like, well, let's study not the pathology, you know, let's study what we can become, mm -hmm. right, like the potentials of human being, right? So, um, and then he was one of the founders of transpersonal psychology together with Stanislav Grof, who was coming from Czechoslovakia and then Maryland Institute, uh, he here in the uh, in the states, like studying psychedelics, mm. studying investigation with uh, LSD psychotherapy. So the confluence of those two, humanistic psychology, uh, and theogenic research or psychedelic research, and there against the countercultural climate of the late 60s and early 70s, mm -hmm. plus the coming of the Eastern traditions into the West and the popularization in the counterculture is what kind of created like a kind of like a fertile ground for the emergence of transpersonal psychology. So, so Maslow, whom you mentioned, is famous for this hierarchy of human needs where he yes. says, OK, I forget what's on the bottom, but it's something like eating, you know, staying alive and, and, and so on. And the, the needs and you get up to kind of social needs and so on. And then I forget what's at the top. But I gather the idea is yes. we can be more than we are at the top. There, there is a form of fulfillment exactly. that that we don't all achieve, but it's available to us all, or something. You know? Exactly, and some, there was something like crucial for the emergence of transpersonal psychology, and that was like a, the convergence or apparent convergence between Maslow's peak experiences, and then the, what people were experiencing when when they were like taking psychedelics in the sixties here in the states. You know, many people started taking psychedelics recreationally, and then suddenly they realized that they, you know, it was serious matter that they were kind of like like having sometimes the deepest experience of their lives, you know. Sometimes they were like mystical experiences, spiritual experiences of different kinds. And then at the same time, like uh, like the, you know, Eastern traditions, like Buddhism and uh, Tibetan Buddhism and, uh, and also Hinduism were coming into the West, you know. Mm -hmm. So people were reading, like, books by popularizers like Alan Watts, you know, and D.T. Suzuki and many others. And then they were realizing, like, 
holy, holy cow, like, look at that, you know, uh, all those, all those experiences we're having here, you know, some of them, like, really similar to the ones that are described in the Eastern traditions are something very valid, very important spiritually, and it's not yet something that we're kind of, like, treating here, you know, or, like, going into some kind of regressive states as psychoanalysis would, would want it. Okay, so those are some of the roots of transpersonal psychology. Now, now, if someone, if, if you're at like a cocktail party and somebody says, so what is transpersonal psychology? And, 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 and I have to leave in like 45 seconds. So you have like two sentences. <laughs> yes. What is, what is the shortest encapsulization mm-hmm. of transpersonal psych, what, what it is? I would say that transpersonal psychology studies the interface of psychology and spirituality and its applications for the contemporary world. So it is explicitly spiritual, and then it uses that word, and, and that distinguishes it from a whole lot of uh, yes. psychology. Uh, I mean, even even you know therapeutic psychology, which I guess is yeah. the tradition it's in, right? It's a, it's a. Um, so uh, okay, so it so it is it is explicitly uh, spiritual, and and it sounds kind of Eastern. Why the word transpersonal? What is that? refer to yeah transpersonal is a word that many in the field don't feel very happy with and uh, it has problems transpersonal uh, originally uh, meant that uh, people were experimenting a state of consciousness in which their sense of identity transcended their normal sense of self for example people could experience like uh Oh, um, I'm not like uh, just, you know, my normal Jorge Ferrer working my, you know, like within my, what Alan Watts called the ego encapsulated skin, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So, uh, and then like sometimes my sense of identity includes other aspects of like nature, you know, or uh, or identification with other persons or with uh, Mm -hmm. entire species, you know, or identification with the cosmos, you know. So that kind of transcendence of like uh, ordinary personal identity is what the term transpersonal originally wanted to convey. So this gets back to kind of the Eastern roots, the idea that, you know, the the dissolution of the bounds of the self in some sense or uh, the the, the bounds of the self are not to be taken as uh, final and fixed and, and rigid. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Now, you can find, of course, again, in Christian mysticism, they might describe a feeling as being a union with God. But even then, if it's a union, then the bounds of the self are not as uh, rigid uh, and airtight as they might have seemed. So there is that kind of commonality. But, but that's what the term transpersonal refers to. Exactly, and uh, and as you're saying, like uh, most Christian mystics, uh, even those that they experience union with God, I mean, they would hold that union like uh, a phenomenological or experiential union that somehow maintain like an ontological gap, mm-hmm. an ontological distance, an ontological difference between the creator and the created, and that's a huge difference, you know, with uh, Eastern traditions like Advaita Vedanta, you know, or many new Advaita schools that they said there is no gap, that uh, you are that that Atman is Brahman. And this is one of the reasons, among many others, that why the perennial philosophy fails. Right. So when you say Atman is Brahman as a, as a, as a teaching of Advaita, Advaita Vedanta, that the idea is that Atman, the self, the soul, the individual soul, is the kind of larger universal soul or something there, the same. And, yes, then, so- and, then, and, and that not only is distinguished from Christian mysticism, but from Buddhism. B- Buddhism has a different interpretation of the breakdown of the bounds of self. It's that the self doesn't even exist. It's not that it gets united it yes. was an illusion in the first place. So it's not a merger of the self with right. the self with anything because the self doesn't exist in the first place. So there are all these differences. And, mm-hmm. and I guess this is one reason you're skeptical of uh, one reason you're skeptical of perennialism. So what? Mm. So, OK, so so participatory spirituality, I gather that is that a kind of a subset of transpersonal psychology or a, a particular branch of thought that has emerged from transpersonal psychology? I would call it the latter. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, my book, um, you know, I wrote the book as my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation here at CIS, and, uh, and it was like, a, as the title says, a critical revisioning of, uh, of transpersonal psychology. And then the, I kind of uh, developed like this, uh, 
uh, notion of participatory spirituality in connection with two other authors, you know, like Richard Turner, you know, and John Heron, uh, and other people who were using the term participatory before me. So in a way, I was kind of like try kind of like to bridge uh, the field of transparent psychology with that kind of participatory thinking in that revisioning. So um, that's that's what I was trying to do. That, uh, but then like um, I would say that participatory spirituality is uh, it goes beyond transpersonal psychology. It's kind of like a spiritual sensitivity, you know. That uh, uh, my second book was on religious studies, and we invited. Uh, it was a credited anthology uh, called the Participatory Turn, and we invited scholars from different religious traditions, you know, from Sufism and Christianity and like uh, and Buddhism and so forth, you know, to write like uh, to engage participatory thinking from the perspective of their traditions. So in a way, many of them they found like uh, participatory elements in the traditions or the possibility, fertile possibility to reconstruct the traditions along the lines of participatory thinking. Mm -hmm. And that was part of what we're trying to do there. Okay, and what does the word participatory refer to in this context? Mm -hmm. Okay, one of, the, one of the easiest way I find to explain participatory is in terms of co-creation. Co-creation, and that co-creation can be of three different types at least. One is intrapersonal co-creation, so that uh, our spirituality is co-created by the different aspects of who we are. So, that, so that's, body, particip- that's within an individual, there is in a certain sense participation of the parts of the individual with one another. Exactly, the fuller, the, it's like the participation of the fullness of the person, like uh, all of who we are, you know, like the body and the instinct and sexuality and the heart and mind and consciousness, you know, all of the fullness of who we are participating as equals in the co-creation of our spiritual path. So, so does and that mean is, they are yes. integrated and coherent and working in harmony as opposed to seeming, as opposed to there being a lot of internal dissension or in conflict or what? That's, that's, that's the aim and that's the horizon. Yeah. And I'm, in the favor. Goal. I'm in favor of that. I would, I would like that. I would like that. If, if, you, exactly. if you can figure out how to bring that to me, I will definitely sign up for your religion. Exactly. And this is important because so often like uh, spirituality gets kind of like, or the spiritual pursuits gets kind of like a uh, sabotage but by different like parts of ourselves, you know. Sometimes our spiritual ideals are in tension with uh, instinctive drives, you know, or emotional impulses, you know, and so forth, you know. So the aim is to really to invite and to uh, gradually align all of who we are, all those worlds in the unfolding of the spiritual path. And that's one dimension. Okay, okay. now one, one thing, one way religions often address that when there is tension between the spiritual goals and certain impulses is to, in one way or another, subdue the impulses. I mean, I, I, would, I would say that, you know, in, uh, well, I grew up Southern Baptist, and, and, you know, so things like, you know, lust and anger, they were things we should uh, struggle against internally. Uh, at the other, yes. you know, and, and then and with, say, mindfulness meditation, the idea is not so much to repress certain feelings, but to uh, have a perspective on them that makes you less enslaved to them ultimately. So mm-hmm. it is so. So that's a, a common uh, a common thing is that you know, in one way or another, subdue the influence of certain kinds of feelings. Mm-hmm. Now, now, do you is that what happens with participatory spirituality, or is it more like no, let them all let them all blossom and magically work together? <laughs> Well, I, I I wish there was magic for that. Me too. Me <laughs> it takes too. a lot of work, but uh, but it's it's more about the latter. Uh, you know, imagine imagine that the instincts. Let's let's use the metaphor, the image of a tiger, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the tiger uh, is the instincts or the sexual world, the instinctive primary world, and uh, many traditions like uh, they would cage, they would put the tiger in a cage, and they say, let's put the tiger in a cage, and you or outside the cage and develop a spirituality. Other traditions, you know, they would just, you know, tame, tame the tiger, you know, tame the tiger. And we have beautiful images of this in many traditions, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in Buddhist traditions, Taoist traditions about taming of the animals, you know, mm-hmm. uh, taming the tiger, you know, or taming the instinct, you know, uh, not repressing, but just taming it, you know. In participatory spirituality, the idea would be that the tiger is, is running by your side with you, running together, and it's and it's and it's running helps you running to move moving towards kind of like your spiritual goal. So you are using all the instinctive energy. The idea is to align your instincts with your consciousness and your heart, so that there is like a kind of like a you know another difference here is like a, between the. 
um, uh, sublimation and integration, right? Many spiritual traditions talk about sublimation, sublimation of the instincts, right? So the idea is that you are using kind of uh, the energy of one level of your being, for example, the instinctive energy mm -hmm. to open your heart in agape or to catapult consciousness to different states of consciousness, like in mm -hmm. Tantra, okay? Mm -hmm. But this is like using one energy at the service of the others. In participatory spirituality, the idea is that it's about the integration of those energies. Mm -hmm. So it's not just using one energy at the service of the other, but about the mutual transformation of the two energies, so that our the, the energy of our consciousness gets vitalized and even erotized by the vital energy, okay. and uh, our primary instinctive world gets transformed too, with an evolutionary dimension beyond its kind of instinctive drives. Okay, so far it's sounding kind <laughs> of abstract. I'm, I think I'm going to ask you a little about how you actually actualize this, what kinds of spiritual disciplines you exercise or what. But first, let me just get a little clearer on, on one point. So, um, you know, you have these impulses like including anger mm -hmm. and, 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 and lust. And I, I assume uh, y you would say there is such a thing as, as, as giving vent to your anger or giving vent to your lust in a way yes. that is not consistent with spiritual goals, right? So, so there, there is some, there is some notion of constraining the manifestation of these impulses, right? Yes, I know. I, I agree. I know what you are coming from, and I agree with you, of course. You know, but um, I would say like a con constraint is a word. I would say like yeah, some kind of like self-regulation. Right. But uh, the but the goal and the aim is that that self-regulation is kind of like temporary. The the goal is that. Uh, that primary world is transformed, you know, it's transformed in contact with the energies of the heart, in contact with the energies of consciousness, so that um, you don't need to constrain it anymore, so that it kind of like uh, it arises or it gets kind of like uh, gets activated in the right measure according to what is constructive in its situation. And uh, I know that sounds like abstract too, <laughs> well, well, but uh, yes. So, so tell me, what if you practice this spirituality? What kinds of things do you do? Are, are there are there practices like meditative practices or uh, group rituals or what? Yes. Well, one of the one of the practices um, I've been kind of co-facilitating for many years, and that it embodies these principles. But again, it's not the only one. For me, participatory spiritual practice are practices that are embodied, that are relational, and that they are inquiry-driven, you know, that they are not like about like trying necessarily to get like to truths that have been already put forward in the past, mm -hmm. but that are really open-ended, you know, to to find uh, or to enact to new truths. Um, so there's all these dimensions, you know. But um, I've, on my side, I've been kind of facilitating and working with uh, interactive embodied meditations, meditations that bring together like a... Uh, kind of like the field of somatics and also um, the kind of like the contemplative awareness of the contemplative traditions. And this is important because uh, for these different worlds that shape us to, to engage in this spiritual path, they need to be vitalized and they need to be kind of enlightened. They need to have consciousness and energy. And uh, those worlds, because for mind-centered education and mind-centered uh, culture, you know, normally they are in different you know, developmental stages, you know, they are not ready to participate mm -hmm. immediately, you know, with the mind and consciousness in, in a spiritual path, you know. So they need to be kind of awakened, they need to be awakened. So these meditations are very simple, but involve like a contemplative, mindful, physical contact among practitioners to kind of like a physical awaken... Physical contact among, di among individuals. Correct. Wait, is there is there hugging involved? If there's hugging involved, I'm afraid I can't be part of your religion. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, imagine that uh, even though uh, I, I live and I work in California, in those meditations, hugging is not necessary. Okay. That's not the that's Good. idea. Good. Yes. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, Bob, uh, I know that time is passing and I want to make sure that we cover the other two uh, aspects or meanings of participatory because this is just one. Okay. The intrapersonal is just one okay. meaning. And the other is the interpersonal, you know, interpersonal. And this is like a 
you know, like the participation means co-creation with the other, you know, with other human beings, with nature, with perhaps non-human entities uh, that some uh, practitioners uh, claim they encounter in the spiritual endeavors, you know. So there's like kind of like this relational, very interpersonal uh, dimension to participate to the spirituality. And then the last one, and perhaps the more uh, sometimes uh, in crit critique, uh, harder for this one, especially by people in more conservative traditions, you know, is like uh, the idea of transpersonal co-creation, the idea that, that we can co-create with that kind of mystery out of which everything arises, with that kind of creative energy of life and the cosmos, you know, uh, we can co-create our uh, spiritual path, you know, so uh, in a way... Uh, we can like really innovate, you know, in our spirituality. We don't need to follow the the steps of our forerunners necessarily, although they are always source of inspiration. We can also move forward and beyond. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these second two, the the the, the second and third uh, meanings of participatory have to do respectively with a kind of interaction with other human beings. Yes, and and an interaction with something kind of out there. I don't know, is it a divine force or a mystical energy or what? You know, um, I I call it I call it the mystery. I prefer the term mystery. Uh, and uh, by mystery, what I mean is, uh, you know, it's uh, it's kind of the creative energy of life, um, cosmos, or perhaps even reality, the generative force, that creativity. And I think it's uh, the way I frame it is that it's kind of non-determined or undetermined. You know, because as soon as you label, you know, with any kind of like attribute, you know, mm -hmm. you go into kind of the problem of sectarianism, you know, you are kind of like favoring some traditions or other traditions. And this is one of the things that uh, participatory pluralism is trying to, is trying to break down, is trying to uh, stop the, the fundamentalist wars among traditions, you know, all spiritual practitioners, you know, they can, most of them, they can, they can be like, uh, you know, they, they believe deep down that the tradition is not only true for them, but it's like superior, right? Mm -hmm. It's like superior, but not only for them, but for everybody, you know? And uh, I've called like this predicament uh, spiritual narcissism, you know? The deep-seated belief that uh, my spiritual choice is the best, not only for me, but for the rest of humankind or for most of them. Okay, but, don't, but don't you think participatory spirituality <laughs> is the best choice? <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, don't you? I mean, okay, there is, there is a way that it's impossible to avoid that, but there are ways to minimize the problem, you know. For example, uh, when you understand participatory spirituality, not like a, as a new religion or as a new movement, but a sensitivity that can be incorporated across different traditions. Like, for example, and this is happening already, like Christian and Buddhist and Hindu practitioners, they are incorporating the body more. And there have been so many of them like less restrictive with sexuality. And they're kind of like a becoming more relational and so forth and they are more open in their inquiry you know so in a way I see it more as a sensi sensitivity more than a kind of like a, a spiritual tradition in itself or an orientation so being less restrictive about sexuality is part of the deal um, I would say that sexuality is important uh, because uh, for me sexuality is uh, one of the first open, it's an open soil for the transformation in the person of that creative energy of life, you know, in a way, you know, it's the energy that we use to create another human form, right? Uh, another human life, you know, the miracle of life comes through that energy. So it, it's really connected to that very super creative uh, energy of life, you know. So as we put, if sexuality is not an open soil, it's, like, it's full of blogs and uh, uh, ideologies and like uh, kind of like uh, repression, you know, um, the contact with that creative energy uh, lessens. So I would say that there is something there, you know, there is something there about making that uh, world uh, porous or more permeable to uh, the process of that creative energy, you know, for a fully creative or participatory spirituality to, to come forward. Okay. Uh, and on this issue of... Um you know, what, when I said, well, what, do you, what do you call this thing that you're making contact with that's out there? And you kind of chose a term that is not really associated with any of the main existing spiritual traditions, and I gather that's um, part of the idea, that, that you, you don't want to sound like you are favoring any of the existing religious traditions. But mm. I get, are you also saying that, like, if, if existing, if members of those religious traditions want to continue to use their own terminology, God, sunyata, whatever, 
that's fine and and you you could think of them as engaging in participatory spirituality and let them keep their nomenclature yes <laughs> but, but, exactly then, right. but then how is that different from perennialism <laughs> that sounds like perennialism right i mean you're saying you're saying okay you, you're really you're, you're calling it god you're calling it sunyata but you you don't realize it's actually participatory spirituality yes. no 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 okay well, yeah, the, the difference is that uh, oh, no, no, this is this is good. This is a good question. Thank you. The the big difference for me is like uh, you know like uh, what I see is like uh, the different traditions are kind of like uh, developing and co-creating different spiritual worlds. You know, in a way like uh, it is, the perennial philosophy can be seen like this kind of diagram of like different kind of like paths reaching to the same peak of the mountain, right? Mm -hmm. Or different rivers to the same ocean, right? And uh, what I'm saying is more like a, imagine like a tree, you know, that emerges from the same root, you know, that undetermined creative energy of life, but it moves into different directions, you know? Mm -hmm. And the branches can overlap. So you, you find very often overlaps across traditions, but they are moving different creative directions, you know, and I think that's really beautiful and something to celebrate, you know, like Buddhists are kind of creating perhaps subtle worlds and Buddha lands, you know, and understandings of spirituality and of emptiness and codependent rights, and, you know, and uh, the Christians are like co-creating with this mystic something about some personal God. I think all that is fantastic, and I would like uh, those traditions to still continue with their own ventures, you know, and at the same time, I think, uh, and this is where my kind of like more normative kind of hat comes in, you know, like, like, I think it's really good that uh, traditions and practitioners in general, they become like more, more embodied in their pursuits, less dissociative when they work, you know, more in radical relationship with others as equals, you know, and more also open-ended in their inquiries, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, that's an uh, invitation uh, for many practitioners that they can take up or not within in the context of their own tradition. Mm -hmm. And I believe that all traditions have the potential to become very embodied and holistic on their, on their own terms. Mm -hmm. So there are people practicing Christianity or Buddhism or whatever, whom you might point to and say that is what they're doing is, you know, given what they're feeling and the way they're going about it, that is participatory spirituality. Even if they've never heard the term and they haven't signed up to be participatory spiritualists or anything, th that's <laughs> the way you look at it. You're seeing trends, you're seeing manifestations of this worldview in different religions, and that's like fine. You're willing to leave it like that. You're not. You're not asking that they that they that they abandon. You know what their pre-existing tradition and sign up for participatory <laughs> spiritualism or anything. Exactly. Exactly. In a way, like um, you know, when when we put together that anthology and religious traditions, that's what we wrote in the introduction. You know, I say we're kind of like in a way we're giving voice to an emerging contemporary spiritual ethos that we see happening across traditions. You know, and especially in the contemporary West, modern West, but also in Asia. You know, forms of engaged Buddhism. You know, like more concerned with like social ecological concerns. You know, forms of embodied spirituality. You know, here in the West. You know, take for example Reggie Ray critique of uh, some forms of uh, Buddhist practices disembodied, you know. It's a kind of like critics that are internal to the tradition, you know, and they're moving in those directions that we call participatory. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the answer is yes. Okay. The, um, now, you, you keep using the word embodied. Is this related to uh, another term I hear that I really don't have a clear sense of is like embodied cognition and so, you know, that's a <laughs> That's a term I'm hearing. Is this related? Are you do you subscribe to this idea of embodied cognition? Um, one of one of the um, one of the big influences of this uh, what I call participatory spirituality. It is uh, Francisco Varela right. and uh, Thompson and Roche uh, work on the inactive paradigm of cognition. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it takes uh, cognition to be embodied action. So, and what is uh, that? Like, what does that mean? I, I keep seeing this and I can't get. <laughs> A fix on it. What is what is that? Yeah. I, I, today I read a, a, a strange. I happened to read, uh, yes. not in preparation for this, but something associated in associating embodied cognition with. It was a particular view of what perception and what perception is, and it had to do. It, it seemed to be the idea that we don't really construct our perceptual field. It's more like an absorption of the information out there. But that probably has nothing to do with what you're about to say. So go ahead. <laughs> 
Um, let me try. Let me try. It would be great to have Francisco. Well, he, he died a number of years ago, as you know. But uh, my understanding is that, um, you know, like they were reacting about what they call a representation, representational paradigm of cognition, according to which right. human cognition is like a representation of like a world that is existing out there independent right. Of our cognition, you know, right. and this is like uh, something that has been critiqued harshly in philosophy for many decades, right? Uh, the idea of a pre-given world, of an objective world that exists there, and then we all what we have is our kind of like our different kind of like snapshots of different objective world existing independently from us. Right. And what they are saying, understanding is that uh, cognition is more like a kind of like a it's co-determined. It's like a co-creation in a way. Um, it's like a it's like. W- the organism and the environment, like, they co-create each other, you know, in the same event of that, coming that, together. That's the embodied it's, cognition view? I would say so, because, uh-huh. um, I would say so, because, of course, all, all cognition is taking place also through through embodied organs, like sense of sight, of listening, and mm-hmm. so forth. Take, for example, you know, a beautiful example, you know, from, uh, you know, Tichna Han, a contemporary Buddhist teacher, you know, mm-hmm. talks about this, you know, eating mindfully a, or um, a tangerine, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So the the flavor of a tangerine, you know, like uh, comes together, and uh, that's what Tichna Han would say. It comes together. That's the coming together, you know, of of the particular object we have in our hands and our physical senses, you know, mm-hmm. the senses that makes us human, you know. Mm-hmm. So that tanger, that tangerine for another kind of uh, species or another even unicellular, unicellular kind of like organism mm-hmm. would be something very different, right? It would be maybe, and it would mean different things. It would have a different meaning to them, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what they say, that depending on kind of your embodying uh, cognitive apparatus, you know, the world manifests and falls in different ways. And there is, the claim is that there is no independent fully objective world out there uh, there okay. is something out there no one denies that but there is not just one single viewpoint that can capture that world as objective okay then maybe I misread what I read today or else it was flat out wrong because I <laughs> took it to be be identifying embodied cognition with what is sometimes called like naive realism you know the idea that what you're seeing is exactly what's out there independent of you but embodied yes. cognition doesn't buy into that it is of, it is of the view you know, which Buddhism shares, yes. that we assign meaning to the world out there and in that process uh, construct our perceptions. Yes, yes. And uh, they would claim even further, and I'm sure of, I think Buddhist schools also, some Buddhist schools would go there too, that the, the world itself is being co-created in that encounter. It's not just, it's not just our different perceptions of our world, but uh, it's the world itself, you know, that uh, that emerges hmm. in, in co-arising and co-dependent with our apparatus, perceptual apparatus in different ways. So, so and that's, a, that's a more radical claim. So, so, yeah, and it's a metaphysical claim, right? I mean, that, that's almost not just psychology. That's like, it's like metaphysics to, to say that consciousness plays a role in the construction of reality, right? I mean, is it that claim? Yes, it's a philosophical claim, it's a metaphysical claim, but uh, Francisco Varela and many cognitive psychologists, they would claim that there is a lot of cognitive scientific evidence to back up a lot of that claim, you know, at least, uh, but of course, ultimately, I agree with you, it's philosophical and metaphysical. Is there a particular uh, experimental finding or anything that, that is cited in to, to, to back up the idea of this kind of constructive role we play, or the interactive construction of... Well, um, I remember, for example, in the book uh, The Embodied Mind, uh, Varela, Eleanor Roche, and Thompson. Eleanor Roche is a professor of uh, UC Berkeley here uh, in Berkeley, and um, she's an expert in the um, visual visual cognition. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that she's uh, bringing in evidence that she's bringing to the book uh, to back up this claim is that there is many, many more neuronal pathways kind of like uh, going outward from the visual cortex that inward, you know. Oh, so in a way, oh. like uh, what we are seeing out there is much more an outward construction of our brain than an inward input, you know. So claims like that come back up that, that view. But again, ultimately, I agree with you, it's a philosophical, it's a philosophical viewpoint. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Um... So, so embodied anyway. The embodied view, the embodied cognition view, is it's part of transpersonal psychology, or 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 part of this um, participatory branch of, of of transpersonal psychology, or both. Mm. I would say that um, a bit of both. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say that uh, participatory transpersonal scholars who have been have been bringing like this. Excuse me. 
this kind of like a um, dimension of embodiment, like uh, more to the foreground in transpersonal psychology. But again, there are many other scholars like Rosemary Anderson uh, and other transpersonal scholars who have been working with the body and trying to uh, make transpersonal psychology more embodied in different ways. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of both. And then the other term you used a couple of times is radical, what, radical participation with others or what, what, what how did radical... Well, the last one was like a... You mean the transpersonal participation? I maybe you said radically transpersonal. You said radi radically something or radical something, but maybe. Oh, like, like, uh, like radical relationality with others? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I think what I mean by that, uh, you know, there are different, different things I mean by that term, but uh, one is that, um, you know, here in the Bay Area, when I. You know, when I when I arrived here in the Bay Area many years ago, and it still is going on today, you know, there is a lot of kind of like a spiritual uh, hierarchies going on, you know. Mm -hmm. Like people look down, people look up uh, according to some kind of perceived spiritual level or a stage of development, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, uh, I kind of like tend to uh, break down that with this kind of more radical relationality in which like we are all teachers and students, you know. Uh, and of course... Uh, Spiritual teachers can teach me many things, but perhaps I can teach them other things. So in this in this world of participatory spirituality, it's a world that affirms this radical relationality, you know, in which um, human beings cannot be graded, you know, uh, as a whole, you know, according to their spiritual development. Mm -hmm. And this is one problem that transpersonal psychology many years ago was falling into, especially in the hands of Ken Wilber, you know, and other kind of hierarchical thinkers, you know, who were grading people according to levels of spiritual development, you know, mm -hmm. and that was problematic. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you said that, uh, you know, it, 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 there, there are people out there who, who don't think of themselves as doing participatory spirituality in various religions, but you might look at them and say, yeah, that's kind of a version of participatory spirituality, given the way they look at the world and conduct mm -hmm. their lives and the experiences they have and so on. Separate from that, are there people... Uh, uh, out in California, maybe, or elsewhere, who, who, who think of themselves as doing participatory spirituality and, and like, that's their practice. They're not, they're not Buddhist, they're not Hindu. <clears throat> they're doing participatory spirituality. Is that, like, a thing? <laughs> um, I, I hope not. <laughs> well, is it... Would you describe yourself that way? Are you the only one in the world? No, no. Uh, no, no, I, I, I say I hope not, because... Uh, because I've never been in the business of creating a school or a spiritual uh, school or a spiritual uh, tradition and things like things like this, you know. If some people take it that way, you know, and uh, um, I don't know, I think I would I would feel very sad mm -hmm. <laughs> because my, my my impulse is more like uh, you know take this take this these ideas, take this kind of um, orientations, you know, and apply them uh, into your spiritual path and, and create your own spiritual path and perhaps that takes the place within Buddhism or perhaps it's an eclectic path, you know, like very new age or spiritual but not religious path, right? Mm -hmm. Or perhaps it's something else, you know, but uh, within, uh, within one the people to go into oh um, uh, my religion is participatory spirituality i would be i would be very very sad um that might happen i hope it doesn't happen and i will do it certainly every, everything in my power against that <laughs> okay so if there so if a religion of participatory spirituality <laughs> does emerge you will do everything in your power to wipe it out absolutely <laughs> so, um so um in uh in closing, um, what, tell us a little bit about the California In Institute of Integral Studies. Is, um, is, is that a, uh, I mean, does it have a, a predominant worldview or it's just kind of various people taking, in some cases, maybe vaguely Eastern approaches to things or what? It's tremendous, it's tremendously diverse today. Originally, it was kind of connected to uh, the teachings of the Indian mystic Sri Aurobindo, mm. and uh, the CIS emerges from the California Institute of Asian Studies, 
Haridas Chaudhry, a disciple of Aurobindo, Alan Watts, you know, and mm -hmm. Frederick Spielberg, a professor of Asian studies in Stanford. So those three put that together, you know, but then it kind of evolved throughout the years and the decades, you know, and now it's an extremely diverse environment in which uh, there is, I would say, a spiritual foundation, but that spiritual foundation, there is no one dogma, there is no one doctrine, there is no um, old religious traditions that being taught, you know, indigenous traditions and shamanism and Asian and Western, and even there are programs that they don't identify themselves explicitly with having a spiritual foundation, you know, mm -hmm. that more like kind of like secular, kind of uh, post-colonial or socially engaged in the world, you know, like trying to do the right thing according to their views, you know, but not from a uh, explicitly spiritual perspective, you know. But I would say that traditionally what has identified CIS has been like this kind of a sp integration of spirituality into academia. And it still is part of the mission of CIS, you know, and we do that in many different ways. Not only in terms of content, but also teaching students how to engage their spiritual values as they develop their scholarship, mm -hmm. for example. And so what kind of degrees can you get by studying? Can you get like a master's in psychology or a, what, what, is the, what are the disciplines? Yes. Well, there are many degrees uh, in psychology, like clinical psychology mm -hmm. and like somatics and drama mm -hmm. therapy, expressive arts therapy, like like healing arts. That's mm -hmm. one school. Mm -hmm. And the other school is called a school of consciousness and transformation. And that's where my program is. It's called East-West Psychology that involves kind of the integration of Western psychology, Western traditions, Eastern traditions and indigenous and shamanic traditions in this dialogue of psychology and spirituality and applications, you know. There is philosophy called small young consciousness, there is social and cultural anthropology, women's spirituality, and so forth. So there are like two different schools. One is perhaps more uh, applied to clinical practice, and mm -hmm. the other is kind of like more applied to scholarship and uh, social applications. Okay. So, sounds very California. <laughs> of course. <laughs> sounds like you found the right home, the right home for it. Um, <laughs> So and, and and just to summarize, I mean, you're you're what what you're doing is in a sense, what would you say? Providing you're 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 trying to provide tools to people in various spiritual traditions to use. Uh, you hope constructively. Is 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 in other words, you, you said you're not start, trying to start a religion yes. or something. But yes. so are you? You're just offering kind of tools and perspectives, and people can take what they will and. I think it's a good way to put it. Uh, I think it's a good way to put it, very simple way to put it, and very accurate too. Like, uh, I think I'm trying to provide a sense of tools and orientations and uh, notions. For example, I'll just give you one more. Um, you know, in Buddhism, there is, of course, something called the Bodhisattva vow, right? The Bodhisattva vow that, you know, one renounces liberation, you know, until all sentient beings are liberated, mm -hmm. okay? So um, uh, in the context of a participatory spirituality, I have suggested, like, the idea of, like, a integral bodhisattva vow in which like the conscious mind renounces full liberation until the body and the instincts and the fullness of the human heart can be free as well and this is important because for example uh, uh, if we get liberated only in our conscious minds and uh, a lot of disciplines like work predominantly there you know in the realms of consciousness you know we can believe we are fully liberated because our sense of self normally identifies itself with our conscious mind, you know. Right. We can be we're fully liberated when in fact we are not. Parts of ourselves are still alienated. And of course this is, I think, a sign of this is, you know, when we have like all these, you know, problems with the spiritual teachers who are kind of like supposedly enlightened, you know, and then later they behave like uh, in immoral ways, you know. Right or in very problematic ways, or sexually uh, inappropriate ways, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that suggests for me that different parts of themselves, you know, are not as awakened and as discerning as their conscious minds might be. Yeah, I think there are Buddhists who might say that people like that, that, that the Buddhist texts, if you, you know, read in their fullness, would not call people like that liberated, in, until they've done what you say, right? I, I mean, I mean there's, a, there's a strong moral strand in buddhism and and i think part of enlightenment is 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 uh being so fully liberated that you you almost naturally behave in a moral way right yeah but but this is this is this is a great conversation but uh i would say that like um you know, the question of morality and enlightenment is a fascinating topic, and uh, there are many different schools of thought. Sure. Some people talk about, like, uh, mystics and enlightened mystics as going beyond sure. morality, right? Uh, other people think about them as very moral. And other people think about them about something that, you know, they they can do anything they want, right? Almost immoral, because uh, they are free to do whatever they want, you know? Right. 
But uh, I would say that if we if we look historically, you know, and look look historically, look at you know cases, you know, what we see is like tremendous moral ambiguity in like in the mysticism, you know, and the mystical mm -hmm. sages, you know, and then um, of course here you have like issues of uh, you know different moral codes, you know, Western codes versus like let's say Indian codes, but uh, also you have a lot of uh, different, you know personality factors and perhaps developmental factors, you know. Mm -hmm. If we take seriously the idea that there are different developmental tasks, you know, that we need to go in order to achieve competence, you know, mm -hmm. in different different levels, you know, of intelligence in our being, you know. Perhaps some of these Indian sages, they were very evolved in a interconsciousness, you know, but not, maybe sexually they were pre-adolescents. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I guess what I, we, you're right, this is kind of largely a separate conversation, Yes, but I guess I was thinking the Buddhist enlightenment in the extreme involves, you know, an austere reading of it is is involving a transcending uh, attachment and aversion in all forms. And if you really transcend those, then you're not going to be like sexually exploiting people, and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be doing all these things that the kind of the kind of naughty uh, gurus do, right? Yes, but not exploiting, but things are things are more tricky, you know, like I uh, had a very good friend, of course I will not be able to disclose names, a very good friend who has been like a Zen student for many, many years with a very venerable um, Japanese Zen teacher in their 80s, perhaps he's dead now. And uh, she told me about uh, sexual contact with this Zen teacher throughout the years and was very constructive and beautiful. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Zen teacher has the discernment, you know, to approach someone that could, could leave that sexual contact with him. And for this, for this venerable Zen teacher, he would tell her that that was like an expression of love, you know. And, uh, and it was something really beautiful that happened there, you know. So not all sexual contacts among teachers and students are problematic. For me, the dividing line is when the teacher in particular, they don't have the discernment, you know, to understand that contact with this person is going not to be constructive, you know. It's going to be, and of course, when they are preaching one thing and doing something else. Right. That's very different. There are some traditions that more a bit iconoclastic around these questions. For example, in Zen, you know, right. sexuality has been like, you know, many things have happened there, you know. Other well, traditions have like very strict morals around sexuality, you know. So so those two things are dividing lines. Is the teacher having the discernment, you know, mm -hmm. and also at the same time is like, are they preaching, you know, what they are doing or not? Well, I, I guess... The first thing I'd want to know is whether all of this particular Zen master's uh, students with whom he has had sexual contact feel equally happy about the outcome uh, before I really yes before I really yes. uh, uh, pronounce him as being uh, all, completely and consistently discerning. But, uh, yes, exactly, absolutely. You know, uh, for all I know, no one has accused this teacher of sexual harassment uh -huh. or sexual misconduct, you know. So either he only had this contact with my friend or the way he did it, he had like this tremendous discernment in which, in which he approached the right people and it was a very beautiful, constructive thing. And at the same time, it's a very delicate thing when there is a power differential, There's you know. a huge power differential. <laughs> It's huge, exactly. I agree with you. So I think it's something in general to be discouraged, and uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, there are certain cases in which um, it has been. You know, we only hear about the problems, right? We hear when uh, with the scandals, you know, when the students who have been harmed and hurt accuse their teachers. Mm -hmm. We don't hear about the success stories. <laughs> well, we just heard one apparently, uh, so maybe this is a first. Okay, well, listen, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jorge. This has been very interesting. There's a lot more to, that we could have talked about. Maybe we'll have a chance to do it on another occasion. Thank you very much, Bor, for the invitation. Okay, take care. Thank you very much. Take care.